Greetings, readers. I'm Audrey Chapuis, the director of the American Library in Paris. Welcome to Evenings with an Author, sponsored by Grow at Annenberg. It is an absolute delight to welcome back Hala Alian here to discuss her latest novel, The Arsonist's City. And Hala first came to the American Library as a visiting fellow in 2018. So I just wanted to mention that our application cycle is now open through the end of this month for our upcoming fellowship cycle. And former fellows also include such luminaries as ta Coates, Samantha Chang, and Jacqueline Woodson, to name but a few. And the fellowship is sponsored by the DeGroat Foundation, and it's one of many ways that the library helps support writers and thinkers. So as a reminder, the American Library is a thriving lending library, a cultural center, and a meeting place, both physical and virtual, for everyone interested in ideas, the exchange of, of meaningful ideas. And I thank you for supporting the library and for being here tonight. And so now to properly introduce our speaker is Gabby McFarland. Thank you, Audrey. Tonight, we are delighted to be hosting Hala Alian for a reading and discussion of her newest book, The Arsonist City, which she worked on during her time at the American Library in Paris in a Beirut smoldering with the legacy of war and an ongoing flow of refugees, religious tension and political protests, a family secrets and ignite, imperiling the fragile ties that hold them together. The Arsonist City explores how we hold on to the people in places we call home. Hala is a Palestinian American writer and clinical psychologist based in Brooklyn. Her poetry collections have won the Amer Arab American Book Award in the Crab Orchard series. Her debut novel, Salt Houses won the Dayton Literary Prize. Welcome back, Hala Alian. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you to Gabby, Alice, and Audrey and the American Library of Paris for hosting this event. And thank you all for coming. Um, I see Grant. I see Nadej, who I haven't seen in like a decade. Hi. <laughs> This is so nice to see your face. Um, I really appreciate you all taking time out of your two, Wednesday, Tuesday um, to join. And I'm really excited to be here. The American Library of Paris holds a very, very special and dear place in my heart. It's, it was where I worked on this novel and it was also where I met a bunch of incredible people that I'm still in touch with today. And um, I don't know, it was just a really magical time and I think about it often. So I'm very grateful to be back. Um, I guess to give y'all a head, like a sense of what today will look like, I was going to do a little bit of a, like an intro of the novel, kind of like a quick overview of the plot and introduce the passage that I'm going to read. I'm going to read for about like 12 to 15 minutes, um, which I know is long. So I'm going to try to like <laughs> keep it interesting. And, and then we'll talk a little bit about like how this book came into being, the role that the library played in that, like what the research and the structuring and all of that was like. And then I think we'll, we'll spend a nice chunk of time on Q&A for people who might have questions. So this is the book, it's called The Arsonist City. I, that's not a good way of holding it up. Um, it is, so it's basically two stories that are woven together. And one is of a, the matriarch who is a woman coming of age in Damascus in the seventies who desperately wants to leave Damascus and move to Hollywood and be a big actor, um, and then gets kind of embroiled in the civil war that's happening in Lebanon, which is the neighboring country, um, ends up reluctantly agreeing to marry a Lebanese man and move to California, where things don't go as she planned. She kind of ends up being kind of like an immigrant's wife um, and has a lot of resentments and secrets that she's keeping from her family. The second narrative takes place present day Beirut, um, where the whole family gathers over a summer. So this is like the adult children and everything to try to prevent the father from selling their ancestral home and a lot of like tensions and secrets and stuff get revealed. So you, you spend time in the perspective of the parents and then the three adult children in the present day. And I wanted to read the very first chapter that's in the perspective of Nash. Um, the audio is not working. Is my audio work? Can people hear me? Okay, okay. Oh no, Heidi, I think maybe it's just not working for you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm essentially going to be reading the first chapter or part of the first chapter of the character Naj, who is the youngest child. She's 29. 
she sort of rebelliously left California and went to Beirut to study her undergrad there and then became a relatively famous, successful rock star musician. Um, she's also queer and kind of what she's done is put an ocean between her and her family to sort of be able to live the life that she wants to live and make the mistakes that she is making, um, of which some of these will be revealed here. So this is, we, we, we start, the chapter with her having just gotten off the phone with her brother who's telling her that the, her parents and everybody is coming to Beirut to gather which is kind of like her nightmare situation. When Nash gets off the phone with her brother Mimi she turns to the sleeping woman next to her. She opens her mouth in a silent scream. It's time to go. She swings her legs from under the covers and holds her breath as she moves through the unfamiliar bedroom, the only light a nubby candle they'd lit a couple of hours ago. It's a one bedroom and Naj uses the glow from her cell screen as she makes her way down a short hallway to the bathroom. The overhead light is wincingly bright. Her parents are coming. Her sister is coming. Naj turns the faucet on and drinks straight from the tap even though she knows the water is dirty. It makes her feel hearty and powerful to drink it anyway, like her body was made for this place. Her head is pounding. The remnants of vodka martinis and a small but quality line of cocaine. The sleeping woman is named Maggie. She's a coworker of Naj's friend and the damage will be minimal. They hadn't even exchanged numbers yet. Her friend will be annoyed about the Irish exit but Naj needs to go somewhere she can think. Her mind well-versed in lying after nearly 30 years of secrets, girl crushes in middle school, doctored report cards, the decision to move to Beirut, churns expertly through pretexts. Mama, Baba, she rehearses silently. I'd love to have you come but I'll actually be on tour. Or maybe there was another bombing last week right next to downtown. I don't think it's a good idea. Or even, and Naj likes this idea, telling them that she's planning on going to America this summer, then waiting until the last minute after they've canceled the trip to say she couldn't after all. She pees, the toilet seat cold to the touch. Her left forearm rests on her knee, the little red fox staring up at her with his pinprick eyes. Naj thinks of Maggie's lips parted in a moan, her teeth against Naj's nipple. Thanks for nothing, she whispers to the fox. She'd gotten the tattoo on New Year's Eve, adding to a collection of nearly a dozen. But this was the first one she'd gotten completely sober. She had watched every line of red fur come to life, the way the needle curled the fox's tail into itself. What does it mean, the tattoo artist had asked, and Nash quoted from The Little Prince. You become responsible forever for what you have tamed. The artist seemed impressed, so Naj left it at that, not saying that when she'd read that line again, years after the first time, she thought not of imaginary planets, but of unfamiliar bedrooms and the countless cigarettes she'd smoke listening to women cry. She thought of, telling, of them telling her that she was ruining their lives, of how she would try to look understanding, try to explain it wasn't them, it was her, there was just something about her. The fox was a reminder that you, that is Naj, become responsible forever for what you have fucked. She got the tattoo thinking it would be a chaperone, a reminder not to pounce every time she saw a pretty face. But when you've just done a sold out show in Biblos, the stage surrounded by Phoenician ruins as old as dirt, so that you feel like a conqueror staring out at the sea of dancing, screaming bodies, your violin, violin bow, bow moving like Zeus's lightning bolt as though your arm is no longer your own because it's not. It belongs to the crowd, to the music, when you're screaming your own words into a microphone and then suddenly standing in blackness because the electricity had just been cut because, fuck it, it's Beirut, Naj had started screaming and the audience echoed her words, magnifying them a thousand times over. When the show is over and you're at the lip of the stage with your bandmate, a large neon pink sign with your names blazing over your heads, bowing over and over the applause like the biggest love you'll ever know, all you'll want is a body to sign your name on. Enter Maggie. She had muscled her way into the circle of people surrounding Naj at Payan, her favorite spot to go after a show. A group of friends, her bandmate Joe and the crew, all good looking men from Beirut, effeminate but straight, ordering rounds of kamikazes. Naj had felt someone's hand on her arm, heard a husky Australian voice in her ear saying, you're phenomenal. Maggie looked like a soccer mom bobbed hair, plastic glasses, but she made frank eye contact as they spoke, clearly gay, and when they went outside to smoke, she'd stumbled into Naj, who'd laughed and held on a second longer than necessary. 
You've got the smile of a wolf, eh? Maggie said too loudly. Their ears were ringing after the show. It's my, it's my, it's my messed up tooth, Nash told her, the well-rehearsed story of falling when she was a child. A couple of hours later, they were naked in Maggie's beth, bed, the other woman licking the chip bit and purring, I love your messed up tooth. Now, Naj walks back to the bedroom and collects her bra, jeans, and purse, all strewn across the floor like a breadcrumb trail. One of the walls is covered with photographs. The room smells like vanilla and sex, and Maggie sighs in her sleep, Naj hurriedly finding something to write on, a receipt on the dresser. Thanks, she writes, and crosses it out. Early flight today, had to go. There, simple, non-committal. She adds a little heart, then leaves. There is no flight, of course, but Beirut is a big city. Once outside the apartment building, Naj lets out a comical sigh. It's nearly four in the morning, late early, as Joe likes to say. Some of the neighborhood uncles are already out for sunrise strolls. A tired looking man is walking a beige Labrador. Maggie lives in Jamaize, 10 minutes from Naj's apartment. Naj dislikes this neighborhood with its fancy bars and overpriced tea shops, the locals accommodating the influx of expats with yoga studios and European style cafes. She cuts through Rougourad, humming one of her own songs, feeling better already. The tattoo guilt dissolves like perfume in the warm air. Her t-shirt is torn and her ribcage exposed and nothing feels sexier than sex. Everything will be all right. She'll call her father, convince him not to come. Maybe she'll even see Maggie again in a week or two after enough time has passed so that there won't be any confusion about intentions. At this hour, the city has a narcotic event, effect. Ambient noise drifts from the passing cabs, a French song, the sound of a man coughing, and the few people on the street share a certain camaraderie, nodding, smiling wryly at each other. Beirut is an insomniac city, unfocused, filled with half-finished buildings and impromptu crowds. There has been a high-rise under construction on Naj's block since she bought the apartment several years ago. She'd lived in this neighborhood longer though, since her move from America. The newer houses live dissonantly among the older plain ones. This city does not change from neighborhood to neighborhood as much as from building to building. And Naj is tired of remembering the former incarnations of places. The spa that was once a fabric store, the health food market that was once filled with antiques and toys. Her own apartment building is similarly disjointed. The glass entrance has been cracked since December, but there's a stupidly ornate chandelier in the lobby, refracting light on guests like confetti. The elevator hasn't worked in months. Abu Nabil, the building's, building's cranky middle-aged super, lives in a small room next to the stairs. Someone decided to paint the stairwell a modern dark red, but then abruptly changed his mind on Naj's floor, where the walls of the stairwell become beige. Each floor has two apartments facing each other, and Naj likes her neighbors an elderly pair of widowed sisters who go out every Sunday in matching dresses and honest to God church hats. There's a hand painted sign on Naj's front door that reads, abandon all blank ye who enter here. The space intentionally left bare and people have scrawled in things like Wi-Fi and bras. The sisters have never complained. Naj's apartment smells stale like something yeasty left out too long with undertones of weed, even though she hasn't smoked in days. Near the window, an assortment of plants droop in various stages of dying. Naj always forgets about them. One second, she promises, then trots to the kitchen and fills a mug. She goes from plant to plant, watering the dusty soil. You get water, you get water, you get water, she sings out like Oprah. The water bubbles in the soil, then starts to drip onto the windowsill underneath. The plants remind her of her mother, of the swampy smell she'd bring home with her after a day at the greenhouse. The apartment is a three-bedroom. Too large for her, but over the years, the rooms have filled of their own volition with guitars and clothes and hosted a succession of friends who'd left their exes. The electricity cuts off most afternoons and the balcony rail squeaks anytime anyone reels, sorry, anytime someone leans on it. And the water runs hot for only a few minutes at a time, but she loves it. And more than that, she loves the idea of herself as loyal to modest living. The apartment represents her restraint. She could buy in one of the high rises, but doesn't. Her band's ethos is folksy. Naj had once been called the proletariat's duchess on the cover of a European music mag magazine. The amount of money in her Credit Libane account embarrasses her. Her own father was furious when she bought the apartment. She was only 24, flushed from the surprising success of her first album proposal. 
It hadn't reached the United States, but sold well in Europe, taking off like a rocket in random cities, Amman, Kosovo, Athens, Riyadh. What the audiences seem to have in common, mused the Guardian article Naj had taped the refrigerator, are places of censorship, corruption, oppression. The musical duo fronted by Naj, Ney Najla Nasra, creates an album of defiance with guttural lyrics, powerhouse performances, and most compellingly, a mixture of Arabic and English lyrics. So the listener often might be unsure of what is, unsure of what is being said, but is happy to sing along anyway. This is stupid, Baba, her father had thundered on the phone. Stupid. First, you say you want to study in Beirut. Stupid number one. Then you say, Baba, I can't live with Jiddo, even though he is your grandfather. Stupid number two. But okay, I pay for rent for an apartment five minutes away from your family house. Then, stupid number three, you make some money from your little band. Okay, great. But instead of investing or saving, you want to buy your own apartment in Beirut. Baba, for what? For what? Stupid number four. I thought that was stupid number three, mocked Naj. The little in little band had smarted. Baba, her father continued. It's like the saying we have in Arabic. Oh God, Naj grumbled. Her father had an irredeemable habit of quoting Arabic sayings in English. A single mistake's mistake ensures a double misfortune. Baba, Naj interrupted. I get it, okay? I'm making a mistake. A stupid mistake, he corrected. A stupid mistake. Fine. Except I don't think so. I don't have to pay taxes over here. And my friend Joe knows a really good real estate agent. It's going to be great. Can you try to be happy for me? Just practice it. She's the only one that can get away with talking to her father like this. It's not that hard. Nash, congratulations, she says. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Baba. Come on, your turn. A double misfortune, her father repeated. But the grave prediction never came true. No disaster had befallen the apartment. And sure, the bathroom leaks during rainstorms and she can't fully close one of the bedroom windows and twice the gas from the stove has leaked, the last time forcing the paltry fire department of Beirut to break her door open when the neighbors complained. But if Nash felt a slight unease when a doorknob literally fell out in her hand or when the bathroom mirror cracked, she pushed it out of her mind, scolding herself for being superstitious like her sister who sprinkled salt on her children's heads when they were babies and always entered airplanes with her right foot. She purchased the apartment five years ago. Her father has visited once. He shrugged after walking around the rooms and said aloud to the coat hanger as though Naj wasn't right there, she overpaid for it. Frankly, she would have paid double. She loves the apartment. It was the first place outside of the California house she grew up in that became hers. She steps out of her sneakers now at the bedroom, a vestigial holdover from her mother's reign. No shoes in the house. What are we, Americans? The floor cool and dusty beneath her bare feet. By the time she's gargled mouthwash, cursorily, cursorily rinsed, rinsed her face and heaved a pile of clothes off her bed, the sun has begun to rise, pastel as a baby blanket. Nash falls onto the bed with a sigh. She'll deal with her parents later this morning. She'll come up with a story. The visit to California is a good one. Everything will work out. From the street below, there are sounds of awakenings. A car engine starting, someone talking to a child. A, fam a female neighbor's voice rises up, bonjour, and Nash falls asleep. All right. So that's a passage. Thanks, friends. Um, let me take a sip of water. That was a lot. Hmm. So basically, I just want to talk a little bit about how this book came to be. So I, it's a little bit of a well, kind of ridiculous story, but I had a dream in 2016. So this was still as like I was editing Salt Houses and it wasn't out in the world yet or anything. I had this really intense dream and in, like it was, a, it was a winter month, it was like January or something about this woman who was Syrian really wanted to be an actor. And then I kind of like dreamt the plot of her life. It was very, it was like, I was the woman and I was watching the woman and it was a movie and it was very, I, I tend to have intense dreams, but this was like one of the few that had like a coherent narrative from beginning to end and like dreamt her moving to California and being deeply disappointed and kind of like raising children in that, that, that mental state um, and woke up and frantically was like, I need a laptop and just sat down and wrote like just, word vomited like 10 pages of, of everything that I could remember and then sent it to my brother who was like I don't know what this <laughs> what is this it seems like a, a synopsis of something like I don't know what this is and I was like I don't know what it is either I then kind of put it aside because I still had a lot of work to do around salt houses and then there was the launch and I was working on shorter fiction for the next like year and a half or something but the woman really stuck with me 
At the same time, I was working on a couple of short stories that centered expats in Beirut, which is a whole subculture that is like fascinating as somebody that was kind of part of it. And by expats, I both mean the Asian, like the actual Westerners, like the Americans, the Europeans, whatever, and also the expats that are the kind of the Americanized Arabs, the folks that came to Beirut just to go to, course, to college or come to study Arabic for a semester, whatever. It's a very specific kind of like vibe. Um, and I, I spoke with my editor. So once Salt Houses was launched and we were done and that was kind of in the world, I started thinking about working on a longer project and sat down with my wonderful editor, Lauren, and was like, what? I can't decide. Like this woman kind of haunts me, but I really want to write about the expats. What can I do? And she was like, why don't you try to do both? Is there a way to do both? And she was like, what I need from you is an elevator pitch. And me and my brother spent an entire afternoon literally in the elevator of my apartment building as people got in and got off writing up and down. And I would just be like, what if the mother, what if she's the mother? And he'd be like, mm, I don't know. What if she's an expat? I don't know. And like, just like pitching ideas to him as we were literally writing the elevator up and down for like two hours. Um, and then finally I was like, wait, she's the mom of someone who's in, who is in the expat community. And then also maybe she has other kids. What if one of them is this, one of them? And you know how like when you're brainstorming and you're in that creative vibe and you're talking, me and my brother are, for all the ways in which we argue ferociously, we, we have like a similar kind of um, creative aesthetic. And so he got really excited and I got really excited and we were just like bouncing ideas off of each other and then kind of honed in on the, the loose central plot of the, of the novel in those two hours. And then I called Lauren the next day and was like, what about this? And she's like, okay, got it. you got it. Like, so just, that's perfect. Um, and to be clear, you don't normally have to get, you don't have to get your editor's permission to write something. The reason that I did it in this way is because the first book, Salt Houses, I can't remember who said this. And every time I do something, I'm like, I need to look it up so I can credit them. Someone said the way you write a first, the best way to write a novel is to write one. Like the best way to learn how to write a novel is to write that one. And that's how you learn all the things that you need to figure out how to do, all your like linguistic tics, all the things you need to sort out, how to approach it, what ritual, what's, you know, what a routine works for you, et cetera. And that was very true for Salt Houses, which I wrote purely based on like curiosity and intuition. And I have a practice of 30 minutes a day, which I can talk about more if people want to hear about that. But I, I have like a limited amount that I write every day. I do half an hour a day. And that's how I, what I've been doing for almost a decade now. Um, and what I would do for salt houses, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd write whatever I wanted. So I'd be like, I'm going to go to the eighties now. No, I'm going to go back and write something in the fifties or whatever, all connected to the novel. And in the end, what I had was, was a folder on my desktop with dozens of Microsoft Word documents that were titled things like argument in Paris or like Kuwait invasion or this conversation on the balcony. And then I had to go and stitch it together to create a story that was cohesive and made sense and cursed myself approximately 10,000 times as I was doing that because it was so annoying. It was so easily avoidable if I had just like had a little bit more of an outline. So I had to stitch all of the, these like discordant parts into something coherent. And I afterwards was like, not gonna do this again. And I think I may have overcorrected a little bit with the second novel, but I was like, I really wanna have a, an actual idea of what I'm doing here. And so I met, I had the conversation with my brother, kind of had this elevator pitch, talked to the editor, and then I did a little bit of storyboarding. I borrowed a lot of it from like what people do with scripts, right? I'm a very visual person, so I buy like different colored note cards and then for different characters and different points in time, mapping it out. Obviously, once you start writing the characters like misbehave and do things, you know, you didn't expect them to do and you have to change the story and that's fine. But I, I always had like a frame that I didn't have in Salt Houses. So I always knew what character was where in what year, for example, and like how they got from one place to another. And then what happened in between would change in the writing process, which was fine. Um, and then I got to the research and more of the, like the meaty part of it. And that is where the American Library came in because I, I inter actually interviewed with Grant, who's here, um, and spoke about, and you know, talked about like kind of the vision of the project and where it was at and why I thought the time in Paris would be really useful. And then frankly, and I talk about, <laughs> I talk about the library all the time when people ask about residencies and stuff, because it's the first 
frankly, potentially the last time that I actually used a writing residency super effectively. And I think it had a lot to do with like the fact that I didn't have anything else to do. And it was a, it was a full month. It wasn't just like a week somewhere, right? It was a, it was a nice chunk of time. I had my own writing space and I was surrounded by books. And I really think that made a big difference. Like being in a quiet space where there were just books everywhere. Like it, there was nowhere for me to, everywhere I would look, I'd be reminded of why I was in that space and what I was here to do. And I used the time to really dig into some of the research of, I, look, I'm someone that lived in Lebanon for eight years, um, went to AUB, went to American University there and lived in the Middle East for, I mean, at this point, I'm getting old, so like maybe half my life total. But, but I still, there's so much in terms of history. I'm not a historian, I'm not a political scientist. There was a lot of research that I had to do and frankly, something like a civil war, I think this is true of all civil wars, certainly true in, in the, the Lebanese civil war. If you ask 10 people in Lebanon what started the civil war, you're likely gonna get 10 different answers. So th it's very much an, a, an event where you, it, it, it was hard to do like kind of objective research because you do like primary and secondary sources. So I would talk with people that were there, um, but a lot of times their experience was colored by their what their political allegiance was, what their faith was, because it was very sectarian, where they lived, what neighborhood they were in, whether they were they were someone that was had left, had immigrated, or someone that had stayed in Lebanon. People had very varying stories. Um, and so a lot of the research that I tried to do was a mixture of both, you know, of trying to really just sort of like read the dry version of history and then like really listen to people bring it to life and doing it with a place, Salt Houses talks a lot is is really based on Palestine and the, the family is very Palestinian and even, and I'm, I'm originally, that's my origins, Palestinian Syrian. And, but I also didn't grow up in, in Palestine. But I've, I visited once, I have not lived there for an extended period of time. So it was a very different experience to do this research and read about the history relatively recent, the seventies and eighties are not that long ago. Like do the research on all of the, devastation and death and destruction that happened during that war while also being like I know Beirut I like I, I could I could track what the result was I could track how like this neighborhood had gotten the way that it had gotten and I knew the neighborhood like the back of my hand you know and I knew the people and I very much felt immersed and Beirut very much feels like a home to me um, so that was also an unexpected process part of this process was doing research on the history of a place that you know really well and then st it's starting to also both illuminate the plot of the novel and what the novel needs to be what it becomes, but then also illuminate for me, I walked away from this process and from the research, a lot of which, like I'm saying, happened when I was in Paris, with an understanding of this place that I loved that I did not have before. I also spent a lot of time there researching like Hollywood and like who were the, like, who were the stars that Mezna, who's the mother, would have been like taken by and super, you know, inspired by in the 60s and the 70s, who are the people that she would like, she would have liked, you know, would have kind of based her life on, what are the movies that she would have watched. Um, so yeah, it was just, I mean, all, all told, it was like a really, I don't know, it was a really, really lovely time. I'm already deeply nostalgic for it, even though it's only been a couple of years. Um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, I'm happy to open it up for questions. It's kind of me just talking all at you for. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for sharing your, like such a lovely passage. You were worried about us being bored, but there wasn't a second where I wasn't laughing <laughs> or just engaged. So thank you for that. Thank um, you. I have a question because you talked a little bit about, you know, if you ask 10 people um, in Beirut about history, you're going to get different answers about who's ultimately shaped it. Um, and in the arsonist city, as well, and as well as in salt houses, you have this broad range of, of character ages. I mean, I think the youngest character in salt houses is 11. Um, in the arsonist city, you've got these three adult siblings. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, your, your background is in clinical psychology. How do you um, build these characters and how they experience trauma in being in home differently? Yeah, totally. That's a great question. So I think part of it is that I just, I mean, part, part of it you kind of answer is like, I've, I'm also a clinical psychologist. And so I have this like additional benefit of having worked with a number of people in ranging ages and also different backgrounds, right? So a lot of the work that I do is with immigrant populations and, and non-white 
um, you know, clients and their children and their parents and whatever. And so I think that's given me kind of a front seat look into how trauma plays out across migration status, across age, across generation, how the same event could have happened to an entire household, and then how the grandma interpreted, how the mother interpreted, and how the daughter interprets it, like, could be wildly different. So I think part of it is literally just the training has, has, has exposed me to that, which I've been very grateful for. Um, and then the other part, which is more personal, is just like my life has, you know, like, I, I think I, I have, a, I mean, I was about to say, we have a wide range of ages in my family, which is, I guess, every family is kind of a stupid thing to say. So in my, in my family, I have, I'm the eldest. I, I meant that more in the immediate. So I'm, I'm, I'm 34. I have a sister that's 22. So that's already like a pretty wide gulf. And then I have a brother that's 30. I also like a lot of um, culture, like, you know, different cultures around the world. This is very true to Arab culture spent time living with my grandparents. You know, my, my grandmother would come visit us in the States when we lived there for months at a time and live with us. When we moved back to the Middle East, we, we like were attached at the hip with my cousin. I basically was raised with my cousins as siblings, really more than cousins. I felt like I had a second mother and then a third mother and then a fourth mother in my aunt, my grandma, my great aunt. So there was very much a communal tribe like um, it takes, it takes a village kind of to raise you. I definitely felt that even with all the migration and even with the displacement, that, that feeling, which I'm very grateful for, it's definitely still held true in my upbringing. I, so I say that to say, sometimes in Western cultures, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here, so forgive me, there can be a little bit of a, a, a division or a, the word I'm looking for, distance between the generations, right? So like, you see your you see your grandparents like every now and then and like you have somewhat of a relationship but it's not like you're not like living with them for big chunks of time right similar with parents there are certain parts of the world this is changing now with <laughs> with covid because a lot of people moved back into their parents houses but generally speaking there's this idea that like you're 18 you're 19 you move out in the middle east frankly most people that i know you know live with their parents well into their 20s um depending on how conservative the house is sometimes until you get married that's much more culturally normative so I had exposure for prolonged periods of time to different ages within my family too. So to hearing my grandparents' stories, to being, you know, to talking to my great aunt for like long, like stretches of time, to being around my sister, who again, when I was in college, she was five. So we were during the 2006, the Beirut, the, 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 the Hezbollah Israel war, um, essentially my sister was, my sister was like five or maybe six. One of my cousins was like 12. I was 19. My mom's in her 40s. My dad's in his, you know, like there was such a wide range. We were at my grandparents' house for most of it. And you just watch this wild range of experiences. Like me and my cousin, who was 11 at the time, we'd like, every time we heard a bomb, we'd blow balloons on the balcony because that would settle him down. And that would like bring down his anxiety. And then it would go and like, listen to like my mom, you know, my mom watching the news and cursing. And then like, go talk to my grandma who'd be like, let's just like read some Quran. Everything's going to be fine. She'd like lived through so much at that point. She's like, it's going to be fine. We're all going to be okay. Either we'll die or we won't. You know what I mean? Like there's such a matter of fact attitude toward it. So I think there was such a, like, I think this is a very long winded answer, but essentially I think part of it is that I've had really, um, the privilege of getting to see different ages and different generations react to traumatic events in a very close and personal way. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, I don't wanna be selfish. So go ahead and submit um, in the chat there, but I have a follow-up for that is which building on your background in clinical psychology and also the fact that the arsonist city um, in Salt Houses is you know slightly, it's autobiographic, fiction, if you can even say that, but you're building on your experiences. Sure. How do you avoid, I mean, you understand so deeply how trauma works. You understand so deeply how your family functions. Um, how do you avoid, because I found salt houses, there's so many flaws. Arsonist mm -hmm. city, there's so many flaws. How do you avoid being contrived? You, you know, your work being so contrived because you, you find a way to avoid that and you, you make the mundane seems so interesting. Um, but I feel that sometimes when you have this rich background in something, it's so easy to, um, to, to, to make that linear, but you mm. don't, you know, you piece it, piece it together. Um, if that makes sense, I'm just kind of I mean, curious, it, it, like it, how, how do you show instead of tell? Because I, having such a deep background in a subject area is also a double-edged sword. 
as an author, right? Because you still want it to have that flawed feeling. So how do you do that? That's, I mean, first of all, it's an incredibly kind thing to say. Thank you. Um, I don't know what I would say is the closest. My, my guess is that it has to do with the fact that I'm really fascinated with what seems like the mundane. I'm really curious about it. I'm kind of obsessed with gathering moments and like, like these small, like the, I don't know, you like drop someone off at the airport and like the small sigh that you let out, like that's both like sadness and excitement and gratitude and whatever before you turn around to go back to your car. Like, like that, I don't even know why I thought of that right now. Like, it's just like there, there, I, I pay attention to the world and to tiny moments in a way that I think honestly is sometimes to my detriment in my existence because it means that I'm a deeply nostalgic person. It means that I'm somebody that kind of like can get really obsessive or, or, or get like can lose the, the forest for the trees, so to speak. But I think it everything is like a weapon and a tool depending on how you hold it. It ends up being useful in writing in that I think I, I do I do think that, that that genuine curiosity and like delight in those small moments, just it's something that I like reproduce on the page. Um, but it's but it's not it's not very conscious, which is interesting because I think I've always said like I feel like I sound like an idiot on writing panels when people ask about writing process and whatever because I'm like I don't know you just do it like I don't like I don't really like and I think this may be the consequence of not having done formal education in it like not having done an MFA or whatever. There's a lot of stuff that I don't have language for. But I, but I can directly see how it connects to how I am in my life. You know what I mean? Or like what I'm interested or curious about in my life. So I, th I think that that like those honing in on those small moments is definitely one of those. And I guess that plays a lot into your poetry, which I also have a question yes. about because you talked about how the arsonist city, you know, was this dream. Um, Salt houses started off as a short story. Um, and I read the 29th year and some of your poems I mean, there's a poem about being in Olive Garden and being with a dad, being with your father. I don't know if it's your father, but the, you know, the, the narrator, yes. um, being in this uh, Olive Garden in the Midwest as an Arab American. Um, and I was like, that, that's, a that's a story, that's a scene. So how do you go about choosing to what to elaborate on, what stands on its own as a poem, you know, what's pro, what's going to be end up being prose, what are you going to leave as poetry, what's a short story, what's a novel? Right, 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 right. I mean, I think so in terms of what moments to include in writing, I think I just, I like have an ongoing list of things that I like over here or get excited about or the way the color looks, hitting the tree, this time, like just like random things that I keep in a list and honestly must most of it never ends up getting used but the stuff that sticks with me does similar to this dream right I have this dream two years later I start writing this book and the, the woman had stuck with me I have dreams every single night that I remember but there was something about this one that stuck with me um in terms of what format and again kind of a non-answer I feel like usually the story tells you what form it wants to be in because you'll start writing it in one form and either that will feel right or it'll be like this isn't working so it, it, like, I think there's something about some things, some stories, some truths want to be poems. Some of them want to be nonfiction and some of them want to be fiction. And I do think for me, there's sort of like this metaphysical, like I, like there, there's this talk by Elizabeth Gilbert where she talks about sort of like being like the vessel or the, like the receptacle that like the writing goes through and that like, you're just sort of like, I'm here and I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna do my work. And then a lot of it is sort of this intangible, like being inspired, brainstorming, et cetera. I very much feel like that. And I think that when I start writing a poem, for example, sometimes what happens is I'm like, I reach what I think is the end of the poem. And it's like, there's no way I'm done telling this. And I'm like, oh, maybe this just wants to be a short story or I'll have an idea for a novel and get really excited about it and write two pages and be like, I think I'm done. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. And then they're like, maybe this is a poem. So I think, I think part of it is the material and the content will, will tell you what it wants to be one way or another. That's a great point. And I have someone who's um, curious for, about further, has qu further questions about your process. What is the relationship with, what's your relationship with audience when you go about choosing um, how to tell something, how long something's going to be? Um, do readers play a part in your writing process? Yes and no. They do more now than they did. So, so when, when I was writing the first novel, 
there was no audience. At that point, I had published a couple of collections of poetry. Virtually nobody reads poetry. There's no money in it. It's very exciting for you. I love poetry. I buy poetry all the time, but it's very exciting for you and other poets. And that's kind of it. Maybe your mom will buy your book, but that's pretty, you know what I mean? Like it's not, you're not doing a tour. You're not having big conversations with a lot of people. Like it's, it's, it's a pretty small community. Um, and especially because the first, like the first book was with like a really small press that were like people that I loved. And it was very much a labor of love. And um, so they were just these small homey experiences that were again, equally delightful, but just different in scale and scope. The first novel, I didn't use the word novel. I remember talking about this at the library last time. I didn't use the word novel until I was querying agents. I kept talking about this longer project. This long, it was like 500 pages, this longer project, this longer project, because the word novel freaked me out so much. So I just was like, it's just this thing that I'm working on. I was actually freer. I think there was a liberation in the first novel that I don't know if you get to have again as a writer, because in the first novel, you're not, the audience hasn't entered your imagination yet. You're not thinking about people reading or reviewing or who's did this person like that or that. I wrote it, frankly, for my parents. I wrote it for my family. I wrote it for my brother. I wrote it for, for the people that I loved in a very, so my audience was a very small crew of people that was like my family, essentially. Um, and then it came out in the world. It was really lovely. It was well, it was with all these wonderful experiences and they were all unexpected and like the cherry on top of this delight of having like written this thing and had my family resonate with it. Second novel, you got an agent, you got editors, you got, you know what I mean? You got like, and I'm not, I mean, I'm no like big author, but it's like you, you have a little bit more of like, you know, every, every day or two, I'll get an email on my website being like, I read your book. Like you have some, you have some understanding that there are like are eyes on you and eyes on what you write in a way there isn't in the first one. And you have to, at least for me, I had to work really hard at like muting that to the point that what I, what I think I do to trick myself into writing novels is to tell myself no one's going to read it. So most of the arsonist city, I was like, no one's going to read this. It's fine. Just like do your thing. Keep experimenting. No one's going to ever see this. Um, and then when the time comes, you're you're like, okay, it's already done. So I think that that's, that's been a big part of it. I also had to try really hard not to write for, I think sometimes if you're a person of color or like a member of a marginalized community, you, there's there's a way in which you can perform and you can get like you know what people maybe want out of you and you know the story they want out of you and it's like really tempting to just do that because it's easier and frankly there's probably more money in it and and it, it's really it was really important to me and it had to be like a constant practice of mindfulness of being like write this story for the people for, I mean it's essentially for really the audience that I had in mind at this point got bigger but it was still like family people that knew Beirut, this is really like a love letter to Beirut. So like people that knew that city was, I would say kind of the focus of it. Um, and then in the editing process, you get your editors coming in and saying, look, you might need to do some translation here. You might need to think about like an audience that may not know anything about the civil war. We may need to do a little bit more explanation, a little bit more context, a little bit more plot, a little bit more whatever. And then you can make the decision with them, like how, to what extent you want to do explaining, to what extent you want your readers to do the work, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a practice of just like being kind of intentional about, you know, sort of just just remembering that this is not about the final product, which is really funny because I wouldn't be here right now if there wasn't a final product, right? No, no one would invite me to talk anywhere if there wasn't a final product, but, and that's kind of the dichotomy and the dialectical truth is like, it's, it's both that which gets you to meet amazing people and have conversations and the fact that you, you have to try on a daily basis to like re renew the contract that you have with yourself for this to be about the process and to this, for this to be about the writing because everything else, it's amazing to hold a book. It's amazing to win an It's wonderful. I'm not, I'm not lying, I'm gonna culture you. It's amazing, it does feel really good, but it also like fades. But the writing, the thing that you do every day, that practice, that becomes, you are what you do with your minutes, that becomes part of who you are and part of what your life is. And like that has a value that's, that's totally different than the product. Yeah, it sounds like the ultimate accountability exercise, not only for yourself, but contractually, um, once you get that second agent at work. Um, so that's really interesting. We have some questions now about characters. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned sometimes that your characters misbehave. Um, <laughs> can you speak to a moment in the arsonist city um, where a character misbehaved, uh, stepped out of line perhaps, um, and, and cha ultimately changed the tra trajectory of the, of the yeah. story? So I wasn't going to have Naj come out to her siblings. 
I didn't, I, because there's something towards the end, you discover that something very traumatic happened to her um, by someone that was like homophobic. And, and I kind of, the plan was for me to have Naj like start the book with a secret and end the book with a secret. And, and, be, and especially because the book a lot, frankly, has to do with like secrets and what we keep from people that we're close to, what we don't, what our secrets do to us and people around us, et cetera. And I was like, there's already a lot of reveals happening here, especially from the mother. Um, so my plan was not to have that happen. And then I just started writing the scene and there's all, the, they, they all like take ecstasy or something and go out dance, the, 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 all the adult siblings and go out dancing and they do it. And like a lot of people make bad decisions that night. And then I was, I was planning for the focus to be more on another character, another sibling. And then I just like found Naj telling her brother and was like, what is happening here? This is not what's supposed to happen. Also, there's a character, I mean, this is a bit of a spoiler, so I won't say too much about it. There's a character that sets a fire at some point where I was like, not, I, I had met arson more metaphorically <laughs> in the title. And then as I was writing, there was actually an act of arson. And I was like, okay, I guess this is what's happening. <laughs> That's great. And I, I mean, as for constructing the characters and how they interact with each other, um, I've also noticed this in your poetry as well. You, you integrate a lot of Arabic. Um, you also integrate a lot of French, which for your characters in Salt Houses in the Arsenic City um, is a, a language associated with occupation, right? So how do you decide, you know, what words, um, that when you want to depart from English and what can't just cannot be conveyed right. um, without another language? That is such a good question. And again, wish I had a better answer. I think it's a lot of it's intuition. Um, I think a lot of it, it sort of, you were sort of saying that I think there are some words, even if 90% of the people that read the book are not going to understand it because it's an Arabic word that I'm like, this is the precise word that I need to use here. And people are just going to have to figure it out from the context or Google it or whatever. Um, like I've, I don't have a problem with readers doing a little bit of work because I think that's what we all do. Like you read a book and you have to do the work with imagination, sometimes looking things up, et cetera. Um, I do think part of it is like driven by intuition and also by like the, the, the chapter that I, the thing that I just read where you hear a woman saying bonjour, like that's, it is, it is a language of occupation in Beidou. It's the French were there for a long time. The Lebanese also, I mean, again, this is super broad brush and it's not true for everybody but there are some Lebanese and there is sort of like a subculture within Lebanon where there is the feeling of like I think exceptionalism and specialness because of the occupation by 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 France and that like that it sort of confers an almost European status I think that's something something that's becoming much more outdated that like people in my generation and younger are sort of resisting against but but it's but it's definitely there like streets are Arabic and French, sometimes in English, like like you know what I mean, like the the the, the France's fingerprint is all over Lebanon, um, and and so it's really it is kind of part of the culture there. So there are ways and like sort of like you know linguistic customs and norms where it's like it would make sense to use those words because that's realistically what somebody would do in that country. And was your time in Paris enlightening on this front at all? Um, obviously, you being in France. Um, did that change your perspective? Did that inform um, how you wrote about these occupied areas and the, the fingerprints you describe? I mean, I, I'm a, I love Paris and I, I love a lot of Europe, but Paris in particular, I'm like very attached to. I don't think it's a coincidence that I love Beirut and therefore love Paris. Obviously, I think there's something familiar, something about Paris feels familiar, because I spent so many years in a place that again, I feel like has been touched by Paris, so to speak, right? Or has sort of a legacy left behind by the French. Um, so I, I, I do think that it was, it was illuminating in that sense that I, I was kind of like, oh, this, like, I think what, what that month, because I'd been to, I'd been to France before a lot, actually, like maybe a dozen, something like that times, but it had always been shorter trips. And my parents have a, a house in, like near Vierzon, very randomly, don't ask. They also don't speak French. I don't know why they bought a house in like the countryside where no one speaks English, but they, they have this house. And so sometimes in the summers we'd go and like be in the country, which is again, very different than Paris. So I had never spent a extended peer, period of time in Paris like that month. And I think one of the things that I took away from it was realizing how comfortable and how familiar it felt 
and then kind of drawing that connection of like, oh, it, it probably has a lot to do with the fact that you lived somewhere for years that, that I don't know, has a lot of this legacy for good and for bad. I mean, it's like, look, we can't pretend it's not an occupying force, but also there, I mean, there, there are aspects of it that are really beautiful, kind of removed from the occupying legacy. And drawing on that, your familiarity, we have another question about characters, um, which may come with spoilers. So hold back on those, but okay. is there a character in the arsonist city in which you put most of yourself into? You That's most such of? a good question. I think I think I have Easter eggs of myself in every character I write, even the like 65 year old white guy, right? Like I think, I mean, I think there are parts of myself in everything that I write. I do think in this book, probably Naj. Like I think there's there's a lot of me in Najla. There's a lot of me in her kind of like her identity markers and identity struggles. There's a lot, like I think in a little, I, I think I'm better, but I have historically, especially in like late teens, early twenties, was a big drinker, was kind of a liar, like a, a perennial liar, <laughs> like had a lot of problems with honesty, had a lot of problems with like addiction. And I think there's there's definitely an element of that in her and kind of a sneakiness to her personality that I was like, I can get into this. I remember what that was like. Um, and also I think she, she's the character that has lived in Beirut the longest in modern day. So writing her was such a delight because it got me to be in that world again. And on a final note, are you working on anything now that we're privy to privy to knowing about? Are you interested in certain regions um, for any future work? Yeah, so I, I'm doing two things. So I had been working on a novel and then stopped around the time pandemic started. I think fiction just became harder to work on for me. And I started working on nonfiction and I have this, a book that recently sold thankfully to Simon and Schuster, that's like a cultural memoir on the concept of erasure. So it's kind of talking about how erasure is something that's done to certain communities, but then also internalized erasure. So like, like things like eating disorders, addiction, codependency, whatever, the ways we erase ourselves. So it's sort of like a look at that kind of from a cultural lens. Um, and then the novel, which I am getting back into now, is a woman actually who lives in Paris. What, how did I not make that connection until you just asked that question? Yeah, so she's a woman that starts off living in Paris, Arab woman living in Paris, clearly living out some fantasies here, guys. <laughs> Arab woman living in Paris who is from Savannah, um, who kind of left her hometown of Savannah, Georgia after her college roommate was murdered in college in, in her undergrad years and sort of got away from all of that and is going back a decade later, something pulls her back to her hometown and she's kind of deciding to try to figure out what happened with that murder. So, so a totally different kind of plot, but there's still elements of stuff that's pretty familiar. Well, we look forward to having you back when I would love published. it. Yeah. Very fitting and hopefully you can be here in person to speak to that. But, oh my God, yes. But Hala, Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, it's such a pleasure to finally meet you. I've heard so many great things about you and to hear um, a passage from the Arsonist City. Likewise, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming and joining.